Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar, a uh, virtual CPD 56 side event titled Why Education Matters for the CPD. It's not just about fertility. Um, this webinar is co-hosted by the Population Council's Evidence for Gender and Education Resource Program and UNGAI, the United Nations Girls Education Initiative. Um, we'll begin in a couple of minutes um, while people log on. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, if you experience any technical difficulties, please message the host using the chat, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. During the webinar, all participants will remain in listen only mode. And as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded um, to be made available following the event. Please share questions you may have to the panelists by using the Q&A window, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And all the information I've shared um, will also be posted in the chat window. Thanks so much for joining. We'll start in about one minute. Welcome everyone. Um, hope you are having a lovely day. Um, you're joining the virtual CPD 56 side event titled Why Education Matters for the CPD. It's not just about fertility. Um, we're gonna begin shortly and just wanna alert people. If you have any technical difficulties, please message the host using the chat, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, during the webinar, participants will remain in listen only mode. And as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded to be made available following the event. Uh, please share any questions you may have with the panelists by using the Q&A window, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And all the housekeeping information is posted in the chat window in case you need that. Okay. Let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our virtual CPD side event, Why Education Matters for the CPD. It's not just about fertility, co-hosted by the Population Council's Eager Program and the United Nations Girls Education Initiative. I'm Nicole Haberlin, Senior Associate, um, Director of the Eager Program and Education Lead at the Council. We thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. We know there are a lot of other events and also, well, it's a stunning day outside in New York City. <laughs> so thank you for joining. Um, we have an exciting hour planned. Um, one of the things Eager aims to do is build the evidence base in gender and education and foster conversations around it. So this year's CPD, um, the theme provides a great opportunity to highlight the multi-sectoral impact of education. So we're gonna look at how education, does regular conventional school, how it may improve health outcomes for women, their future selves and their children, We'll examine whether schooling is also helping reduce sexual violence. And finally, and critically, what happens if we leverage education more explicitly um, to transform gender norms? With that, um, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists today. Um, Fatima Zara is an associate with the Girls Center at the Population Council. She's a social demographer who has worked extensively on adolescent transitions to adulthood in LMICs including the intersection between education and health outcomes. Tia Palermo is Associate Professor at the University of Buffalo, State University of New York, and President of Policy Research Solutions. Her research examines impacts of social protection and economic empowerment programming on health, gender-based violence, and other dimensions of well-being. Antara Ganguly is a Director of UNGAI, a global partnership to advance gender equality in and through education. She's an expert on policy and programming related to gender equality and women's and girls empowerment and a fierce feminist. Thank you all for joining the panel. And now I'll turn to Fatima, who's going to give us a peek at where we are in a massive systematic review, examining the potential pathways through which education may impact health. Fatima, over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, hello and welcome everyone. Um, I'm really excited to share an update from our ongoing systematic review on causal pathways between education and three health outcomes, fertility, HIV, and child mortality. Next slide, please. So to provide some background, in 2018, the Population Council conducted two systematic reviews seeking to explore the relationship between education and sexual and reproductive health and maternal and child health in low and middle income countries. 
um, they were able to find three causal relationships between having more years of schooling and women having fewer children, um, greater educational uh, attainment being protective against HIV for women, and greater educational attainment also being associated with a decrease in risk of child mortality. However, there was a lack of clarity and even contradictory explanations as to how this increased um, educational attainment affected these different health outcomes. Next slide, please. So to fill that gap, uh, this review focuses on identifying uh, mediating causal pathways between education and these three health outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, so here we have a pathways framework that works as a visualization of the hypothesized pathways linking education to medium and long-term health outcomes, specifically fertility, child mortality, and HIV status. This is a, I understand this is a complex diagram, so I'm gonna be going over each box uh, one by one. So the first box uh, includes our education exposure variables. So these include grade attainment, uh, academic skills, age at school, living, and socialization. Then in the middle two uh, columns, so that's boxes B and C, um, these represent our pathways of interest. So box B includes mechanisms under knowledge, attitudes, resources, and agency, and box C includes health behaviors and harmful practices. Um, and just by way of an example, so how this would work potentially is, a, let's say you have uh, an intervention that provides exposure to um, uh, tutoring, and that leads to uh, an increase in academic skills or literacy skills. Um, that would then allow, uh, you know, the people exposed to this intervention to have greater access to health-related knowledge. Uh, let's say that knowledge is related to contraceptives, um, and it encourages them to increase their contraceptive use. Uh, this could then either lead to an increase in age at first birth, or perhaps um, an, uh, an increase in, in birth spacing between births. Um, then on the top right, you're going to see uh, this oval um, shaped bubble. Uh, the unobserved, uh, this is the unobserved variable. So unobserved variables like um, ability or motivation may simultaneously affect education, health outcomes, and the mechanisms that link those outcomes, uh, which is why using a causal framework to account for bias resulting from such unobserved variables is important. And then finally, at the bottom of the screen, um, you're going to see uh, uh, that there's a box. Indeed, this represents um, gender norms and community context. So this can include a wide range of moderators, including poverty, availability and quality of health services, disease prevalence, and norms around various different things like education, um, fertility, intimate partner violence, and child marriage, just as examples. We haven't included all possible interactions between these different variables in the diagram, um, but we do want to highlight that um, uh, you know, these interactions do exist both within boxes and then across them. So just as an example, um, you know, having greater resources might also afford greater agency to make particular decisions that are, are health related. Next slide, please. So based on our research question and framework, um, these are our inclusion criteria. I'm not going to go through each and every single one, um, but just to give you a few examples. So we're looking at studies published uh, in 1990 or later. Uh, we're looking exclusively at low and middle income countries because we're interested in causal pathways. Uh, we're looking at experimental studies and then studies with quasi-experimental designs. Next slide, please. We're also looking at both uh, studies with both uh, female and male participants. Um, as I mentioned before, the types of interventions and exposures are all education related and the types of outcomes that we're interested in are related to the mediating mechanisms. So those are the middle two boxes that I just talked about. Next slide, please. Uh, and we, for a search strategy, we included over 25 databases uh, across a number of subfields, just to make sure that we're comprehensively capturing um, the evidence. Next slide, please. 
So we be began this process uh, early last year. We, we started working on the protocol you know, much before that. So I'm really excited to um, share with you what we know so far. Next slide, please. So uh, this is our review process. Uh, we started with about 46,000 articles to go through title and abstract screening. Um, and then we ended up with about 471 articles in the full text review, which is um, basically uh, both reviewers going through um, the article in a little bit more detail. We ended up with 213 articles in the data extraction um, phase um, and at this point we look at the articles in in much more depth um, going through you know whether or not they should be included for final analysis uh, and we still have about 20 percent of the way to go but we're envisioning having uh, about 140 articles that might end up in the review uh, i will say that at each stage we had two people reviewing each um, article as per um, the Gamble protocol as well. Next slide, please. Um, so we currently have data extracted for 122 studies. That's about 80% of all eligible studies we have. Um, and I'm just going to go through very briefly like some of the descriptive, um, uh, the descriptives that we have from this. So on types of methods used, and this is something that we uh, expected as well, um, around 80% of studies use quasi-experimental methods, um, whereas the rest use experimental methods. Next slide, please. Uh, a vast majority of studies, so nearly 80%, include only female respondents. Um, about 20% include both both uh, men and women, and there's a there's one lonely study on on only men. Um, this might change a little bit uh, as we uh, you know complete data extraction, but we expect the trends to uh, remain similar. Next slide, please. And then this graph shows how frequently a certain mechanism was identified in eligible studies so far, uh, ranked in descending order. So we can see that some mechanisms have uh, more evidence than others. Uh, so for example, there were 45 studies where exposure to an education intervention impacted child marriage, but none that measured impact on health attitudes or hygiene practices. But you know, with that said, there's uh, an impressive range of mechanisms uh, for which evidence is available um, and uh, uh, you know, studies have examined causal links between education and parenting practices and agency and contraceptive use and gender attitudes, um, etc. So there's a lot to unpack here. Um, if there are enough studies that define um, their variables in similar ways, we can potentially do uh, meta-analyses. Otherwise, we're going to do a narrative synthesis. Next slide, please. So to conclude, um, here are some next steps we'll be working on uh, over the next few months. So we're going to be conducting risk of bias assessments. So these are uh, assessments of study qualities for the roughly 140 studies we, we, we're going to include in the review. Um, like I said, we'll do a meta-analysis where possible um, and also a narrative summary of the different study characteristics. So you know what region um, uh, the studies uh, were from and what countries. Um, the age of participants, etc. And then preliminary results are expected in fall of this year. Um, and we expect to be going through the process of the submission for peer review and revisions and dissemination between fall of this year and spring of next year. Uh, and when that happens, we'd be more than happy to do another one of these webinars and, and share those results with you. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for your attention. Back to you, Nicole. Thank you, Fatima, um, for sharing those emerging descriptives. Um, so while it's clear that some potential mediators have been examined more than others, their breadth really is impressive. It's going to be super interesting to see for which of these there is causal evidence of impact. Um, so do stay tuned, everyone. Um, next, we'll get to hear from Tia, who will share her research on edu educational attainment and gender-based violence. Tia, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking about some work that we've done as well as some emerging evidence from the field. Uh, next slide, please. So gender-based violence 
as those of us in this webinar know very well, is pervasive globally and is costly to both individuals, but also to society at large. There are few interventions which have been proven effective at reducing sexual violence among adolescents. And increasingly, the programmatic and research agenda is paying particular attention to primary prevention of violence through particularly scalable interventions and cost-effective interventions. In this way, structural interventions such as education are very promising due to its scale. Next slide, please. Next slide. There are several pathways which we hypothesize that education can reduce the risk of sexual violence. So first, increased educational attainment can delay entry into the labor market. So this can reduce exposure to exploitative workplace environments, particularly those for those with lower skill levels and lower educational attainment. It can also improve labor market opportunities and earnings once girls finish their education, and this in turn can reduce financial dependence on males, uh, the incentives to engage in transactional sex, and can increase empowerment. Increased educational attainment can also delay sexual debut and partner for partnership formation, and this can decrease uh, the risk of sexual intimate partner violence or exposure to that. And finally, Increased education can improve mental health, aspirations, and self-esteem, which can increase empowerment and negotiation skills within intimate partnerships. Next slide, please. Education can also reduce risk of specific forms of gender-based violence, such as intimate partner violence. So increased educational attainment can increase bargaining power inside a relationship. However, this might have ambiguous effects on intimate partner violence, depending on the use or the motivation behind intimate partner violence. Um, it can also delay age at marriage. And again, delaying age at marriage can decrease exposure to intimate partner violence, as we know that younger age is associated with an increased risk of intimate partner violence. And finally, it might increase the quality of the marriage match. So this may lead to protective effects against IPV as a partnership is more likely to be equitable. Next slide, please. We have done some research together with colleagues of mine, Julia Behrman and Amber Peterman, where we looked at trying to tease out the causal impact of education on gender-based violence risk. A lot of studies, as Fatima was mentioning, have looked at associations of the link between education and various violence-related outcomes cross-sectionally, but it is not always possible it's not always possible to say that these associations are causal relationships. So there has been a lot of emerging research around the implementation of what's known as universal primary education or UPE policies. These were expanded in several African countries in the mid 1990s. And these can be used because they're exogenous impacts on educational attainment and they can be used to identify causal impacts of education on IPV. So UP policies, what they did is they removed primary school fees in government schools in Malawi in 1994, and in Uganda in 1997. UPE policies were highly successful in improving enrollment in both countries, particularly among girls. Next slide. So what we did is we looked at women who are between the ages of 22 and 29 from demographic and health surveys, which are nationally representative surveys. These were conducted in Malawi in 2004 and 2010 and in Uganda in 2006 and 2011. We looked at an indicator of sexual violence that was defined as reporting having experienced forced sex or forced sexual acts, either from a partner or another person, or if the individual reported that their first sex was forced. For the schooling indicator, we relied on self-reports of grade attainment. Next slide. So as you can see in the slide here, this is showing the effect that the UPE policies had on grade attainment. So you can see the trend prior to implementation of UPE, and then you see a large jump 
And what we can see is that um, UPE policies led to increases in both Malawi and Uganda in educational attainment among girls. Next slide. The impacts that we looked at, we looked at both lifetime experiences of sexual violence as well as 12 month experiences of sexual violence. And we found that in Uganda, a one year increase in educational attainment led to a nine percentage point decrease in the risk of lifetime sexual violence. However, we did not see any impacts of increased educational attainment on 12 month reported experiences of sexual violence in Uganda, nor did we see any impacts of increased educational attainment on sexual violence risk in Malawi. Next slide, please. We looked at some pathways of impact. We posited that potential pathways of impact could include premarital sex, um, marriage, cash employment, and literacy. And we saw that in both countries, increased educational attainment led to delays in marriage. In Malawi, we also found some increase in premarital sex, and that's likely because as marriage was being delayed, there's longer exposure until marriage. And we also saw an increase um, in literacy. Next slide, please. So that was just one study that looked at these UPE policies to try to understand what is the causal impact of educational attainment on gender-based violence outcomes. There have been other studies that have looked at these or similar policies around expanding education access and gender-based violence outcomes. So one study from Ethiopia, Malawi, and Uganda showed that uh, universal primary education policies reduce sexual debut, pregnancy, and cohabitation before the age of 18. Another study in Turkey, which looked at the expansion of the number of years that children are compelled to go to school, found that increases in husband's education reduced various forms of IPV, including economic, emotional, and physical. A study from Peru, also looking at changes in compulsory schooling laws, found that increases in women's education led to reduction in all forms of IPV that they looked at. And pathways that explained these reductions included occupational attainment, teen parenthood, and partners education. Next slide, please. Now, those were the studies that looked particularly at these increased education access policies and GBV outcomes. However, other studies have looked at outcomes along the pathways that we posit link education and GBV risk. And so I think it's important to look at some of those studies as well. One study looked at various African countries and found that primary and secondary fee removal reduced or delayed child marriage and childbearing before the age of 18. One study from Benin found that increasing the number of schools that were built was associated with decreases in attitudes supporting IPV, so people were less likely to condone, condone IPV. Another study that looked at various African countries found that the elimination of fees reduced marriage before the age of 15, so very early child marriage, but did not have an effect on marriage before the age of 18. And finally, in Uganda, a study showed that increased educational attainment also delayed marriage and childbearing and increased the use of maternal care and immunization among uh, women's children once they did indeed have children. Next slide, please. So in summary, what the evidence is showing is that there's causal evidence to, to demonstrate that increased educational attainment was protective against lifetime experiences of sexual violence in Uganda, but not in Malawi. Because we saw impacts around lifetime experiences, but not 12 month experiences, it's possible that in Uganda, these effects are working through protection against sexual violence earlier in the life course. And these effects may also depend on the level of schooling. So we found suggestive evidence to 
show that in Malawi, among girls with higher levels of education, additional years of education may actually still be protective against violence, but we did not see these impacts at the lower end of the education distribution, nor across the entire sample. The broader evidence base is also supportive of our findings and shows protective effects of schooling or removal of school fees or increased access to schools through the building of schools on intimate partner violence, as well as pathways such as child marriage, pregnancy, childbearing, and less accepting attitudes toward IPV. Next slide. Therefore, interventions to increase educational attainment among girls at high risk of leaving school may have broad term long run benefits. And when designing interventions and policies um, to increase educational attainment and reduce GBV risk, it's important to understand the context because risk factors at the interpersonal level, at the family level, and at the community levels may differ, and so might enabling factors. So factors which might enable an intervention to work better, to have bigger impacts. So for example, school availability may differ, the distance to schools, the quality of the schools, and the opportunity cost of staying in school, as well as labor market opportunities, which might dictate or facilitate decisions around how long to remain in school, that's going to be balanced by what are the opportunities once you finish school in the labor market. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tia. Super interesting. Um, both the fact that education is protective in some settings, but not always, and that your analyses and the broader literature suggests that there may be something particularly beneficial when girls are in secondary or confronting gender-related barriers to schooling, such as child marriage, pregnancy, and childbearing. I'm, curi I'm curious to hear more of your thoughts on it. Um, anyway, fine, thank you so much. Um, finally, I'm, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Antara, who's going to look at how education can shift harmful gender norms. Thanks so much, Nicole, and thank you so much, uh, Fatima and Tia, um, for really very, very gripping uh, analysis. Um, Chinua Achebe's classic 1950, 1958 novel of pre-colonial Africa, Things Fall Apart, tells the story of a place called Umofia, as seen through Okonkwo, a local man of stature. Okonkwo and I may be pronouncing his name wrong, is grounded in an older style. Traditional masculinity, action, violence, and hard work is, are valued above all else. He strongly believes in gender roles and it pains him that his son is not more aggressive. In a meeting at the beginning of the book, he in fact insults a man without title by calling him a woman. Ultimately though, Okonkwo's adherence to masculinity and the aggression that that means to him leads to his fall in society. He becomes brittle and unable to bend with the changes taking place in his clan and in his world. So Okonkwo's masculinity and aggression makes him weak in the end. It leaves him no room to maneuver, even against the white man. And I'll read just a quote from that, from the book itself. Okonkwo himself became very fond of the boy. Inwardly, of course. He never showed any emotion openly unless it was anger, because to show affection was a sign of weakness, and the only thing worth demonstrating was strength. So you may be wondering, why am I starting with a novel after these two really brilliant analyses of data and evidence uh, from Fatima and Tia? Well, partly it's to point out how intersectional these different rights are the right to education, the right to gender equality, the right to self-determination, and as the Chebe shows us, the right to not be colonized. Masculinity in this case overwhelmed the protagonist's aspiration to stand up to the colonial master, his very brittle masculinity. But mostly I'm starting with the, with the novel to make the point that if we consider data and evidence to be a larger universe of articulation and analysis of the human condition, then art and literature is an example of that, has really been centering and elevating harmful gender norms forever. And that's telling, I think. Art 
has always examined and given prominence to gender norms because gender norms are in fact critical to the human condition and situation. So let me move from that reflection to describe what Anga is thinking about and doing to address harmful gender norms in children. We believe, and I'm sure everyone here believes, that children should be able to dream about their future without limits or restrictions. Yet there's a pervasive and universal force in the world that constricts children's aspirations and often leads to violent behavior, and that's gender stereotypes. Stereotypes are widely held beliefs about the character and behavior of all members of a group. Um, and this definition is from a 2015 SAGE publication called Impact of Gender Stereotypes. Um, and it was by Igbo Onu and Obiyo. Um, uh, Emily, if you could put the, the link in the chat that we had discussed, all of the points I'm gonna be making, the statistics I'm gonna be sharing are in this concept note at this link that Emily will put in the chat. While gender norms affect all children, and I mean every child in the world, they disproportionately affect girls and LGBTQI children. According to Save the, Save the Children, more than 575 million girls live in countries where inequitable gender norms violate their rights. A 2021 OECD study of five-year-old children in England and Estonia found that girls and boys imagined very stereotyped futures for themselves. Although both girls and boys imagined futures as fictional characters, for boys, this meant growing into productive, powerful superheroes like Superman and Spider-Man, while girls wanted to grow into beautiful, whimsical beings like fairies, unicorns, and mermaids. And the point I wanna make here is not that one is less than the other, it's that every child should have access to each of those fantastic cre creatures. Evidence shows that when children are taught to recognize the social and not biological origins of gender and gender norms, they do learn to question and reject them. An independent evaluation of a play-based program that reached about 2,000 children in the UK in 2017-2018 showed that children underwent the following changes with regard to toy appropriateness for all children. So toy, ki toy kitchens from 41% of children who thought that was appropriate just for girls, it went to 74%. From 22% of boys thinking that football was just for boys, it went to 70% of boys. And for dolls, girls and boys thought that every 59, from 37% of children thinking that only girls should play with dolls, it went to 59%. Two studies from India, Taroki Toli and Jagriti, both in the state of Haryana, found that play-based programming on, uh, on gender stereotypes led to a 7% increase in positive attitudes towards women's paid employment. And by the way, this in a state that has the lowest in the country on formal paid work for women, a 4% increase in positive attitudes towards girls' education, a decrease from 22% to 6% for boys who believed at baseline that boys are naturally better at studies than girls, decreased from 23% to 2%. Again, this is at baseline, boys who believe that it's more important to educate boys than girls. And a decrease from 40% to 13% of fathers who believe that girls shouldn't go to school because of fear of sexual violence. I wanna share here my most pertinent memory from doing uh, one of these uh, studies that we described here, Jagrati. It was with 10 year old boys and we, they had just done a two week diary of time use, basically looking at time use of their fathers and mothers. And of course they found that the fathers were sleeping significantly longer hours than mothers. They had significantly more leisure time, significant more time with their friends. And the girls sort of, took it on the chin, you know, they didn't look surprised. The boys were furious. And that anger is actually a reflection of the, the hopelessness they felt inside as a result of the love that they have for their mother and their father, but already being socialized into being boys, all of these emotions just came out as anger. So this area of programming on actually addressing harmful gender norms with children whatever has been done shows that it has actually great promise. One does see significant changes in, in, in attitudes, although we haven't necessarily measured behavior yet. But what investment has taken place has been one-offs by NGOs and country offices, 
And even in those cases, there have always been significant findings, but never have those findings translated into sustained, systemic, and systematic investment. This point was actually also made by the Center for Global Development Publication, advancing the agenda on girls' education. They pointed out that this was an area that has not been looked at, except, of course, we'd argue that addressing harmful gender norms helps all children, including boys, and perhaps especially LGBTQ children. I started with Chinua Achebe. Let me end with Helen Keller, that preeminent edu educator who really lived intersectionality. She had said that the highest result of education is tolerance. And that is after a lifetime of teaching children to read and write and count. Tolerance. So let us work together to bring that back to education outcomes. And may I add that the flip side of tolerance is for all girls and boys, and especially for gender diverse children, freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antara. Really compelling. Um, first of all, I want to join your book group. <laughs> um, and I think what you highlight is that we are leaving so much education value unrealized. Um, it's um, we're just this unrealized potential that we continually drop the ball on. Um, so, um, sorry, hang on. I just lost my screen. Okay. Um, all right, so we've heard a bit about the evidence on how education, plain old regular education, can deliver multi-sectoral benefits for health and gender equality, specifically violence and gender norms, multiple SDGs of interest to the Commission on Population and Development. But these impacts may be more likely to arise or greater when education is better in terms of both better attainment, for example, when girls go to secondary school, and better learning, for example, shifting gender attitudes or increasing tolerance. Um, the beauty in these synergies is that improved educational quality is better for education outcomes too. Um, so we've had quite a few questions come in. Um, and I'm going to just take a skim here and um, I'll share a couple with um, the panelists. They're directed at individual people. So um, I'm going to start with um, with Antara. Um, this person said, I was recently looking for evaluations of teacher training for more gender equitable classrooms. And one of the few published studies found that it was hard to shift teacher attitudes. Many teachers drifted back to their previous stereotypes and biases not long after the intervention ended. Now, maybe the intervention wasn't very good, <laughs> but could you talk about your experience and thoughts on how to help teachers shift their attitudes and approaches and what has worked well? Um, yeah, go ahead. I mean, let me take a stab at that and then I welcome thoughts from others as well. Um, it's true that there hasn't been that much work looking at teachers, gender norms and attitudes, however, um, Angai with Education International for several years did some work with teacher unions on school related gender based violence and our approach to that sort of started with starts with and centers gender norms for the whole community. And what we found there, and this is also borne out in other uh, sectors on work with women leaders, so, for example, it bears out in the health sector with work with nurses women doctors it, it bears out in the international development world it's been done with UN agencies is that any work on addressing gender norms has to be personally transformative in some way. So there has to be an aha moment for the person, whether that's a woman or a man. So in these examples that we had done with Education International, we have these beautiful compelling stories, and I'll try to find the link and pop it in the chat, of these teachers sort of reflecting and saying things like, there was this one man teacher who said, who started crying and said, you know, in years, I've been married for something like 20 years. I have never made a cup of tea for my wife. And that may not sound like it's about violence, but it's it's about, you know, gender norms. And that him realizing it with that sense of grief around it 
it would be fantastic to see what changes that led to in his classroom. You know, is he is he doing things differently as a result of realizing the, you know, unfair work distribution in his own home? The flip side of that is some work we had done in India with women teachers, and all this was at UNICEF India. It was a tiny little sum of money, but what we did was organize women teachers in the state of Rajasthan to come together for one day in a year for a day. So all we were paying for was their bus, some biscuits and tea and snacks for them to get together, and that's it. That was all we had money for. There was no facilitators, nothing. Yet the men teachers were in an uproar. They're like, well, if women are getting this, why aren't we getting it? And of course, we wanted to point out, well, you get that every day in your personal life. You get to walk down the street and hang out at a, at a tea stall, which, which your wives don't. Uh, but this also makes one realize that any work on addressing gender norms has to keep the do no harm principle. So just like with women microfinance organizations in the 90s, we found that there was a uh, 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 an increase in GBV in their homes. When we work with teachers and gender norms, we have to think about working with women and men teachers differently. So I would say that's one insight and the other insight is that it, it has to be in some way personally transformative for that person. Let them, let it be an opportunity for them to deal with their gender trauma. Thanks, Antara. Did, um, Fatima or Tia, did, um, do you want to chime in on that at all, or should I continue with questions? Nothing from me. Okay. All right. I, I, I mean, one, pretty well. Yeah. No, um, beautiful examples, Antara. I think, um, and I think what you said echoes very strongly with, you know, work in sort of on life skills education and what makes, what what types of life skills education is more effective and a lot of that is about the sort of this critical thinking and reflection where the participants are, give, are given the space and the support to you know critically reflect on their own life and their own social context and how it's you know it's about you know a lot of people get a bum deal <laughs> and um i think um you know that you know, isn't necessarily work with teachers per se, but I think that is something that carries through um, on any work around gender attitudes and things. And I think the other thing is, I wonder, I'm curious what your thoughts are on Tara, some attitudes are easier to shift than others. Some are really sticky, well, right? It was, I think this is a word that's often used, you know, I think, um, like we're looking, we're doing some analyses right now using longitudinal data from Malawi on the impact of educational attainment, um, literacy and numeracy on different um, gender attitudes. So some of them are around intimate partner violence, some of them are around um, just sort of general gender attitudes and role of men and women. And it's interesting to hear your results because though here in this longitudinal data set in Malawi, they the IPV is there's really no those attitudes aren't affected, whereas the others are. Even you know after we we you know we're doing fixed effects analyses and things like that, there's there's more associations if you don't you know go into those causal analyses. But I think there's you know. I don't know. We have to start with people where they're at. <laughs> um, anyway, okay. Thank you. Um, okay, questions for uh, Tia. <laughs> Did you and your colleagues explore the impacts of the universal um, primary education on physical violence, or was it not measured? And second, your findings make the case that schooling reduces important violence outcomes. Can you talk about how you or or authors in some of the other studies that you, you shared considered whether or how exposure to violence in childhood impacted access to education? Thank you, Allie, that's a great question. Um, we, in this paper, we did not look at physical violence. We restricted it to just forms of sexual violence. And in the studies that we were looking at, or in our own study and the other studies that I looked at, I think people were very focused, including us, on starting at educational attainment and then looking at subsequent risks. So we didn't really look at any 
antecedents to that and really didn't stratify it or look at the influences of adverse childhood um, exposure, such as violence. So I think that's a really interesting question and a really great area to explore more in the future. But unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, Antara or Fatima, do you um, want to chime in on that at all? No, I just wanted to add that the DHS, um, I don't know if they're doing it now, but they don't have an adverse childhood experiences um, tool added um, to the DHS yet. I know the WHO came up with a, a standardized one that's been adapted in different contexts. So and, and unless you have questions on, you know, experiences of violence, particularly, because I think they look at 15 and beyond, but if you, if you ask them like below 10, um, um, those questions don't exist. And it's, it's also a little bit problematic because sometimes in like, you know, uh, very traumatic experiences, it might actually affect your memory and like ability to recall and all of those things as well. So it's, it's a tricky um, area uh, even to measure, but um, certainly important to do so. Uh, and I think on the gender attitudes, it's, uh, this has been like a, it's not, a, it's, I don't think it's a pet peeve, but it's, um, you know, gender attitudes always seem to be a, a catch-all term. Um, and there's many, many different ways of measuring it. And it seems to kind of be like, um, just put together and sometimes not always systematically in different studies. So it's, I think it's important to realize, like, to understand a like how you know what it's measuring and then also to understand that gender attitudes like they're not a monolith you can be very progressive in some ways so for example with education and and uh, uh you know not so progressive when it comes to maybe marital relationships or 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 violence or um uh, attitudes towards your daughter versus your son so um i think those distinctions are important to make thanks No, ag agreed. Um, I, I, and so this question relates a little bit. Um, um, the question is to Tia. Uh, could you comment on the difference in results between Malawi and Uganda? Um, you mentioned that girls in higher grades may have experienced a protective effect. Um, how much is that a self-selection issue um, or measurement issue? Are you, do you, I guess, just elaborate a little bit on that difference? Yeah, thank you for the question. So what we did see is that um, girls in Malawi were more likely to have attended um, secondary school than girls, or sorry, girls in Uganda were more likely to have attended secondary school than girls in Malawi. And as we showed in the main results, when we looked at all the girls together, we saw protective effects of educational attainment on girls in Uganda, but no overall protective effects in Malawi. But when we did look at the distribution across the spectrum of educational attainment, we saw suggestive evidence that possibly at the higher levels of educational attainment, then one additional year of schooling might be protective against sexual violence in Malawi. Um, so I think that there could potentially be explanations around um, possibly the decisions around whether to stay in school, so the quality of schools, but also the opportunity costs and labor markets around, you know, what is when girls are trying to decide whether to stay in school for an additional year, there's a lot that goes into that decision around, you know, what am I missing out by not working this year versus if I stay in school another year, what are going to be my added benefits? How much more money can I make, et cetera? So I think that there's a lot that goes into that decision. So it's not just about access to the schools, which building schools, removing school fees, all of these are really great things that um, governments can do to increase access to school. But it's not just about the access to school, it's about the access to labor markets and balancing that decision about whether to stay in school and what type of opportunities might be um, remaining for them. Over. <laughs> 
May I ask a follow-up question? Um, Tia, did but the two populations you were looking at in Uganda and Malawi, did they have similar exposure or lack of exposure to prevalence of transactional sex? Because that is obviously associated with very high levels of violence. And some populations in Malawi have very high rates of transactional sex amongst girls, adolescent girls. So we didn't actually look at transactional sex and I don't know, maybe Fatima back me up, but I don't know if that's measured in the DHS. Yeah, not to my knowledge, I don't think, but I, I mean, I'm happy to double check, but yeah, I haven't seen that. It's maybe not, maybe in specific like certain surveys, but it's definitely not something that's the standard uh, measure, I don't think. No, it's not. It's not a standard measure unless a country explicitly decides to measure it. But there has been a lot of research looking at transactional sex in Malawi. And there are certain refugee populations in Uganda that also have high rates of transactional sex. I'm just wondering if that could have played a, a role in the difference we saw. Yeah, it's possible, but unfortunately, I don't have a good answer to that either. <laughs> um, here's another question. I'm going to um, um, pose this to um, Antara. This question came in and I, they, it asks, while education is a cure or solution for GBV, and I, I actually I just going to comment on that phrase it's not <laughs> a cure or solution. I mean, it is education is one thing we can do to reduce it, you know, hopefully. I mean, the evidence, I think, is encouraging. Um, and maybe Tia can also comment a little bit on how, you know, on how causal these studies are and how, you know, is, you know, or is there something else that's explaining these associations? Um, but it, it, it's a piece of the puzzle. Um, but the, quest, the question is, how do you see when adolescents prefer themselves prefer marriage early before or at age 15 to education? And I'm gonna let Antara answer that one or start out. I can start. I mean, I think we have to make the difference between anecdotal evidence and survey level evidence. I don't think we have survey level evidence on what adolescents, on adolescents preferring to be married uh, at age 15 or not. Uh, there is, there are pretty significant um, large population surveys on preference for um, marriage and preference of age at marriage in um, countries that have uh, high rates of child marriage. So for example, I know in India and Bangladesh, uh, girls do not want to be married before the age of 18 as a population. I'm not, I mean, there will always be individuals. Having said that, there's a really interesting analysis uh, done by the World Bank and the University of California, Berkeley. It's an anthropological study looking at um, adolescent girls and younger girls in Niger, which, as you know, has a 75% rate of 75% of 20 to 24 year olds in Niger were married before the age of 18. And there you hear over and over again, girls saying, yeah, I, you know, I do want to get married before the age of 18. And I, so I think, so I'm taking your question in, in that spirit and the answers that were uncovered by these anthropologists is in that community, in that family, looking at the options that that girl has and given the bonds that she has with her family and the role that she has been socialized to play in that family, yeah, you can sort of see why she would pick marriage. She has no employment earning opportunities. In many cases, she doesn't have a school to go to and cannot imagine what a great school would look like. Or she has been to school and she has been humiliated and has had a terrible experience because she is behind and has been punished for being behind as boys, boys have that experience too. Plus her parents really wanted to get married. And it'll mean money for her family and she loves her family and she wants to support her parents. And she hasn't seen many women who have done something different while supporting her parents. So the real answer to that would be, you know, flood her with images and examples of women who get married later or don't get married and support their parents and support their families and support their communities. And I think then those responses would, would change. But you're right, there are many situations where girls don't see any other options. And, and from the options they have, that is the more attractive option. 
Yeah, no, and thanks, Antara. I, I would just add, you know, this this point about options. Um, the council um, did a study in Bangladesh, it was a randomized controlled trial, it had multiple study arms. So one arm provided livelihoods training, another arm provided educa you know, educational tutoring, um, and a third arm provided um, more sort of critical thinking about gender and power, life skill. You know, everybody had life skills, but this third arm really drilled down into, you know, sort of this gender transformative life skills approach. And there was a control arm. And you know what? All the intervention arms um, had reductions in child marriage. And part of, I think what we're seeing is this, you know, given like another opportunity, another vision for what your future can be, almost anything will do <laughs> you know there is there's a there's so much we can do and there's so much you know the, the work um antar that you were cite, citing i mean i think would be an important way to get at this you know working in schools to shift the gender norms that sort of drive you know to some extent drive those preferences um i mean and uh, you know and as you also said that, you know, that it's, you know, that these, it doesn't, you know, children aren't in a vacuum. They have families, they have, you know, obligations, they have, you know, their um, communities, you know, so extending outside of the classroom when you're trying to shift gender norms is a probably a good idea. Um, but yeah, no, it's, um, you know, good questions. Um, um, I think, did um, Tia or Fatima, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think just to say one thing, you know, we've done other research looking at um, child marriage uh, in Ethiopia in the context of an economic empowerment uh, prevention program by the government, which, you know, targets households which are which have high levels of poverty with cash transfers and cash for work programs and in these contexts there is very high levels of child marriage and what was found is that the economic empowerment program was reducing delaying marriage to some extent um and one of the pathways was through the education pathway so in reducing poverty, increasing the avail availability of, of cash allows people to pay related fees, even if there's not school fees, you know, there's a lot of other additional fees around sending girls to school. And in turn, the education pathway empowered girls through their knowledge um, and strengthening their agency and access to social networks. So that was really important, both at the peer level, but social networks um, around teachers, they were able to resist marriage or very early marriages in some cases by seeking support from teachers. And they also had increased awareness of, um, of the legality of the illegality of it. So a lot of times there might be laws on the books that necessarily are not being referenced in terms of community practices. So it was exposing girls to understanding what the laws were and empowering them to seek resources if they were in a situation where um, they were subjected to a, a, a child marriage. And so I think it's important to realize that there's not only this educational attainment pathway, which would, was what I was largely talking about, you know, you have more education, you have more bargaining power in marriage, you have more economic opportunities, but just that exposure to school, and I think Antara touched on that a lot, can increase these um, social networks, which can be really important. Yeah, and just I, I think just to add to that, um, I mean, we've done as many people have work on the drivers of child marriage in different contexts, and it is a very contextual thing. So in some in some um, communities, it may be barriers to education and employment. In other communities, maybe the social norms are particularly strong. But I think, you know, especially in surveys, like taking the agency question, first of all, measuring it is, is a bit challenging because you have to probe a bit. Um, but also taking the responses at face value when somebody has been socialized since they're a, a child into a particular pathway. It's, it's 
it, I think it requires more than um, you know the numbers and and something like anthropological work and a bit more qualitative work to really understand um, what agency means in a particular context, um, and then you know to try and tackle child marriage interventions accordingly. Thank you. Um, okay, we're at time. So once again, I want to thank the pa amazing panelists and all the participants for joining our webinar today. Um, and yeah, thank you. Have a great day. Um, we also invite you to explore who is doing what in the gender and education space, where the greatest needs are and the latest evidence at www.eagerresource.org. And we hope you'll join us by sharing your work through Eager. Um, it's a great place to identify partners, donors, ideas, and grantees. And um, subscribe to our newsletter. Um, stay informed. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and goodbye. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.